Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books, where each week we interview an author of a newly published work of nonfiction that we believe is worth your time. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the University of Texas Brownsville or this station. And now, here is your host, Dr. Bill Strong. Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books. I'm Dr. W.F. Strong. I'm your host. And I want to tell you today, I have a special treat for you. If you are a lawyer, if you are a doctor, if you are in law enforcement, if you love CSI, you will love our guest today, the internationally acclaimed forensic scientist, Dr. Bill Bass. Dr. Bass launched the science that launched modern forensics. His work is largely responsible for the CSI movement in the real world and the CSI movement on television. He is a pioneer in forensic anthropology, and he created the world's first laboratory dedicated to the study of human decomposition, three acres on a hillside near the University of Tennessee, where human bodies are left to the elements and studied. Dr. Bass, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Strong. I appreciate you having me on your program. Oh, well, I'm delighted to have you. I want to go back to the very beginning. Uh, there's a lot to cover here, but just so that... Uh, uh, everyone in the audience understands uh, how this got started. Somewhere about 1980, you had the crazy idea that it would be helpful to understand time of death and other such things of, of dead bodies if you just could leave some out and study them. And so you created a what has been what has come to be called the body farm, where you would leave bodies out and keep records of decomposition and other things. Is that basically correct? That's basically. Correct. If you don't mind, I'd like to add a little bit to that. Uh, absolutely. Though. That's what I'd like you to um, do. Uh, everybody said, why do you start a body farm? Well, I wasn't <laughs> yes. walking down the street one day and the light shine. You need to uh, start a body farm. Let me go back. I taught for 11 years at the University of Kansas in Lawrence. Okay. So this would be a lot closer to you than I am now. Mm -hmm. And um, identified skeletal material for law enforcement agencies, particularly the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. Mm -hmm. Um in the late 80s, they were having trouble with cattle rustling in western Kansas. Uh, Kansas has some of the large ranches like you do in Texas, uh, 150, 200,000 acres, that you find in the plains of Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska. And the, if you watch western movies, the bad guys will uh, you know, steal the cows, they'll herd them up and drive over the hill, and they're gone. Well, the bad guys don't do that today. The bad guys either own or rent a refrigerated truck, mm -hmm. and it will go out on these large ranches in the plains area, and they will kill the cows in the field. They will butcher the cows there, hang the meat up in the truck, and drive off. Wow. The rancher comes along one or two or three weeks later and finds all these dead cow carcasses. And the question is... Uh, how long have they been dead? Huh. Uh, the and if you in law enforcement, what you need to know is this tells you where in the sale of the meat they begin to look. And so, uh, the director of the Kansas Bureau of Investigation at that time was a man named Harold Nye, and Harold and I had worked together, and he wrote me a letter asking me if I could determine how long a cow carcass had been dead. And I looked in the literature, and there was really very little in there dealing with uh, length of time since death uh, of it, not only humans but animals or anything like that. And so I wrote him a letter and told him that, Harold, there wasn't much in the literature, and but if he could find a rancher who would be willing to give us a cow and kill it, I'll look at it every day to find out what happens. Ah. Well, it's interesting that you're thinking about things that you don't realize you're thinking about. And I put a P.S. on it, and I said, Harold, we really need four cows. We need one spring, one summer, one fall, and one winter, because your major factor in decay is temperature. Ah. You decay much faster in the summer than you do in the winter. Of course. Well, nothing ever happened with that. By This was late 60s. Uh, I came to the University of Tennessee in 1971 to take over a three-person department that was an undergraduate program only and to build it into a graduate program. But I knew the medical examiner here at that time, a forensic pathologist from the medical school named Jerry Francisco. 
Jerry had helped me gather data for some of my doctoral students at the University of Kansas. And I wrote Jerry that I was coming to Tennessee, and he asked me if I would serve on the medical examiner's staff to identify skeletal remains that came in through the medical examiner's system. And I said, sure, I'd be happy to do that. So it really wasn't long. In the fall of 71, I began to get dead bodies coming in. Mm. And um, uh, I didn't have anywhere to put these. So I went back to the dean. I said, dean, I need this land to put dead bodies on. Oh. Everybody said, what did he say? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say anything. He picked up the phone book to the University of Tennessee and uh. said, uh, gave me the man. This is a this is a land-grant institution. Yes. Uh, and so you would, you would have... What in Texas you have the University of Texas and Texas A and M would be the land grant institution for yes. Texas, but they're combined in Tennessee. And so I went over to the Ag campus and I started with a sow barn uh, before I came to Tennessee. Uh, they used to raise pigs, but they were getting out of the pig raising business. And they had all these vacant sow barns, and so mm-hmm. I um, they gave me one of them, and this was the beginning of the body farm. Now. The real research at the body farm is done by graduate students. Uh, You really need somebody to go out there every day and literally look at that body and see what are the changes and how long are those changes taken. And when you said 1980, that's when we moved. The sow barn was out at one of the ag farms about 15 miles outside of town. Uh And by 1980, business was picking up, and I was getting all kinds of, of bodies coming in and the graduate and where, where did the bodies come from were these uh, d- people who were killed or are these people oh. who just expired uh, oh. who were homeless that's a good question when when we first started being on the medical examiner staff uh they came through the medical examiner system in tennessee and i expect you would have the same thing in texas uh in tennessee if you die and nobody claims your body or they, let's put it this way if you die and your body ends up in the medical examiner's system, as if you were shot or stabbed or those kind of things, and nobody claims your body, then the cost of that burial falls upon either the city or the county in which the death occurred. Well, the cost of burials today are about $800, and uh, the with the budget systems the, the way they are in Tennessee anyway, uh, they would much rather give me the body for nothing mm-hmm. than they would have, say, say eight hundred dollars to bury that body. So, uh, so it's a good deal that, for them, and it's a good deal for you that, in terms right. of research. Now, as time has gone by, the body farms have become um, acceptable to most people, mm-hmm. and has lots of, of news coverage and a good reputation. Mm-hmm. And starting in 2003, which would be actually 10 years ago now, um, people begin to donate their bodies. Yes. Uh, And we have a donation form that they fill out. And uh, in 2003, the most bodies we got in any in any year uh, switched from the medical examiner system to the donated bodies. And the donated bodies have continued to grow and have been the major source of bodies that come into the system. Now, what what happens to the body? I mean, how long do they stay there? Is there a point at which you say, okay, we've learned all we can from this. It's all bones now, so let's yeah. bury it? Um, okay, a, a good question. And you have you've hit the heart of the problem right there. Mm-hmm. Um, when I came through school, uh, this would have been in the 40s and 50s. Um, I'm 84, by the way. Yes. Um, um, if we wanted to learn what's the difference between a male skeleton and a female skeleton, mm-hmm. we had to go to three. There were there were three known anatomical collections in the United States. These were uh, collections of skeletons that were started by anatomists. And they decide who were teaching gross anatomy for medical students, and they decide instead of giving the bodies back to the families or burying them or cremating them, that what they would do is 
since they had all this good data on these individuals, that they would macerate them. That means you would get rid of the soft tissue and you would keep the skeletal remains. Mm-hmm. One of those was at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. One was at Washington University in St. Louis. And one was at Howard University in Washington, D.C. So I had to go to either one of those to look at bodies that were known. Now, the problem with those are that if you end up in a cadaver collection, most of the people in a cadaver collection are notorious for being in the older age ranges. If you're young uh, somebody and you die, somebody loves you and they want to bury you. Uh. But the older you get, you know, you get crotchety and you drive all your friends away and uh, they die and they say, well, you know, he's been a jerk all of his life. I'm not going to pay to bury him. <laughs> <And> so, <it's, laughs> so his body okay. ends up in my collection. Yeah. Now, the police are asking me, we want you to identify somebody from today's population, somebody that was dead, you know, two months ago, and I get the skeleton. Mm. Well, we know that there are fairly extensive changes that occur in the bodies as we go through time. So that if you, let's say that you were in that anatomical collection and you died in, say, 1920, those those ran, by the way, they ran from about 1900 to about 1950, those three collections that I talked about. If you if you died in 1920 and you were 80, that means you were born before the Civil War. Mm. So there's a big difference in the po- in the population now than what it was say 150 years ago. And so I thought what we need we need to build a collection of modern skeletons. Mm. So everybody that's in the body form uh, when the decay process is done. We clean those bodies up, and when the body comes in, is given a number, uh, the year. Let's say this is 2013. Uh, if you were the first person that died in 2013 and ended up in the body farm, you would be 1-13. Mm. So instead of a name, there's a number assigned to that individual. Yes. Uh, that number is written when when the decay process is over. We bring that body in and clean it up, get all the dirt and all the the maggots and all the dry tissue and stuff like that off of the body. And we write that number on every bone. There are 206 bones in the adult human skeleton. And we write that on every bone. That's for the reason, let's say that you, you were telling me about your son. Let's say your son gets interested in forensics and he wants to come here and study forensic anthropology. Uh, And he gets interested in the femur, which is the bone in your upper leg. And he wants to look at 50 females and 50 males. Well, he can do that. Uh. He could go to the collection. Everybody then, gone to the body farm, it goes into a collection of known skeletal remains. Uh, And in order, when he gets done his research, uh, he's got to put all those 50 back into the proper box, you see, mm-hmm. to fit with the rest of the skeleton. Uh, that's why those numbers are written on the bone, so we can get every bone back again. I see. So but, you, you empower all kinds of research, uh, anthropology, right. forensics, uh, we all, have, all sorts of things. We have the largest, and I hate to say this this way because it mm-hmm. sounds like I'm bragging and I'm not. Uh-huh. Uh, we have the largest collection of modern skeletons mm-hmm. of anybody in the United States. Uh, there are about 1,400 in that collection now. But this has uh, helped to solve a lot of crimes. Oh, it has, yes, surprisingly so. And um, and probably to uh, exonerate people as well. I would hope, yes. Yeah. I mean, because uh, uh, like in one of your stories, uh, one of your case studies, there was an individual who was suspected of something, and, and because of the time of death of the body, it couldn't have been that person because they weren't there. That's right. And so exactly. it, it allows you so, to weed out people uh, who otherwise wouldn't have been weeded out. One of the things that I found particularly fascinating was your discussion of skeletal or race identified by a skeletal structure. Because in this day and age, we tend to think of, you know, one race. DNA teaches us there's just the human race and, and um, you know, skin color doesn't have a lot to do with with our makeup. And yet. You say that by skeletal structure, you can identify race. You can. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And uh, obviously what you were saying is it's getting more difficult because as various racial groups, the reason we have races uh, essentially, if you go back, uh, people moved all over the world and they adapted to various climatic conditions. Mm -hmm. For example, blacks, Mm -hmm. uh, before we came along and forcibly removed one group of people from one geographic area to another, they inhabited the tropical or subtropical regions of the earth, the hot, hot regions. Mm-hmm. Um, Caucasians, what we call white, they, they, the, the terms are not really very good mm-hmm. here, but they're the ones that adapted to um, a colder environment, like north, uh, northern Europe, uh, northern, uh, you know, the the colder climate zones. And so you can look at many of the uh, morphological features or the, uh, and some anatomical features. You and I were talking before we started of a case I did in Monterey, Mexico, mm-hmm. of a white male, a 32-year-old white male that tried to fake his death in a Chevrolet Suburban fire. And, uh, and he, had a, he, had, he had a $7 million insurance policy. He, yeah, he did. The four with Kemper and the three with CNA, or maybe the reverse of that. But anyway, um, insurance companies don't like to pay unless you can make a positive <laughs> yes. presentation. Uh, this guy, was, he, he burned yeah. the guy that was going to fake his death. And uh, they called me to go down, and I went down and excavated the Chevrolet Suburban, which was, he put this individual in the Chevrolet Suburban that he had rented. And uh, he happened, though, to make the mistake is he happened to use a 60-plus-year-old Mexican peasant who had uh, lots of of Indian ancestry, American Indians. American Indians are basically Asians, or called mongoloid, and they have, for example, a, a, a genetic characteristic, you know, the shovel-shaped incisors, the, the teeth are a little bit are different. Yes. And the first thing I picked up when excavating the Chevrolet Suburban, hey, we have shovel shaped incisors. Oh, I don't like this. And also that there was a clusal wear. This is where uh, American Indians, instead of having an overbite like you and most of of your audience have, mm-hmm. uh, they would have uh, the American Indians had an edge to edge bite in in, in the incisor region, and it was a clues aware. Well, those are little red flags that begin to fly mm-hmm. when you are looking at skeletal remains. Plus the fact is, the older you get, the, uh, the more osteoarthritic lipping you have. This is, uh, the skeleton simply begins to wear out. Mm-hmm. And when a, when a joint begins to hurt a little bit, uh, the joint does not, the bone does not want to, you know, um, quit. So, what it does, it begins to build up extra bone, and this is called osteoarthritic lipping. And uh, uh, the older you get, the more you have. When I'm lecturing to audiences, I said, you know, how can you keep from getting osteoarthritic lipping? <laughs> and nobody knows. I said, well, die young. That's the only way you can keep from getting it. I mean, you live long enough, and sure enough, this guy had extensive osteoarthritic lipping. Uh, Okay, so so, so to uh, to inform the the audience, the the guy was supposed to be uh, he was thirty years old or so, Caucasian, thirty years old. He was faking his death for a seven million dollar insurance policy, and he got a body from Mexico that was of a guy who was probably sixty, who had been a laborer, who was uh, American Indian or had a lot of Indian in him, right? That's right. And you were able right. to tell this how fast? And. Uh, how fast could you tell this? How many was this hours or days for you to do this examination and say you this is not the guy you're looking for? Uh, let's say, well, I, I would say in this case, after the first three or four hours, I thought you know we this is this is not a 32 year old white male. Oh, okay. uh-huh. It took a couple of days to do that, and then of course you have to write it up. But uh, yeah, you're. The, the length of time it takes is the is the excavation of the vehicle, the, the recovery of the skeletal remains. You see, oh, so Most they, people, they had they, they had. If, if you read the newspapers, the, the newspapers love this the statement: "Burn beyond recognition, uh-huh. hogwash." I mean that <laughs> you you can't do that. Uh, even if you're cremated, I can. I 
do a lot of cre- you we, we were talking about my working with lawyers a lot of my work recently has been uh well the last recently the last 10 years has been looking at cremations mm-hmm. um and uh, you can identify somebody from the cremations but there's no uh, dna left right no there's no dna left in, from a uh, from a cremation from the heat that's occurs in a cremation furnace but you're looking you're looking at muscle markings you're looking at teeth um mm-hmm. Let me just give you one example. Okay. Are, are you familiar with the Tri-State Crematory just in Noble, Georgia, just south of Chattanooga? This is where... Yeah, I guy, remember hearing about that. That was the one where they just got tired of burning, uh, cremating, right. and, and they just threw the bodies back. out. <laughs> there were 339 bodies uh. or parts of bodies out there. And anyway, uh, we had a guy uh, from North Georgia uh, in a in a uh, an old in a retirement home and he had false teeth Mm -hmm. and he took his false teeth out he set them on the the night stand by the bed and died during the night and so the family sent his body to the tri-state crematory to to be cremated Mm -hmm. and the uh the assisted living facility uh picked up all of his his bones including his teeth and send them back to the family. Well, um, the get back cremations, or what we call cremains, mm-hmm. which are the burned remains, and the family wondered uh, when then when when the police discovered that they weren't cremating bodies, then the family wondered did they get back their loved one? Mm-hmm. And so they call the lawyer. The lawyer calls me. I get the cremation, and going through it, uh, there are. Uh, dental pieces of, of dental appliances and uh, pieces of teeth and things like that. Well, obviously, with a guy with completely false teeth and and no teeth at all and no dental appliances, they didn't they didn't get their loved one, you see. Mm-hmm. So those are the things that I've been doing recently, if you say, recently the last couple of years, let's put it that way. Well, one of the cases that you talk about uh, in in your book, Beyond the Body Farm, is the one of the uh, fireworks uh, <clears throat> factory, the illegal fireworks factory, where there was an explosion. Yes. That that's was that's a really fascinating case. I think 83, yeah. And tell us about that. Well, this was, the lo- as a matter of fact, that's the largest illegal fireworks explosion in the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, fireworks explosions are not uncommon, really. But if and, and the illegal ones, uh, but in most cases you kill only uh, anywhere from one to about three or four people. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one uh, in Benton, Tennessee, that's down in Polk County, which is just north of the Georgia border, uh, there was a, a, a family that got involved in making illegal fireworks. And uh, it was an extended family. They didn't want to hire people to, so that everybody knew what they were doing. So it was an extended family. And um, they had an explosion. And in this explosion, they killed 12 people, hmm. uh, and both males and females, uh, and varying in age from 18 to 65. And uh, I went down and spent two long two long days uh, identifying the people in that thing. Most of them were burned, well, they were scorched, let's put it that way. Um, The explosion literally blew the people out, and not straight up, but they blew them up and they came down through the trees. Mm -hmm. And so that was a case in which you had to look up and see if there's clothing or body parts Mm -hmm. in the trees. um, It's gruesome work you do sometimes. uh, Well, yeah. Let me tell you something kind of interesting there. I have worked or worked I, for years. I don't do it now. I worked many years for the Air Force Mortuary Service identifying skull remains. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't had anything from Texas, but did a lot along the Gulf Coast and Alabama and, and Florida at, at the air bases along through there. Uh, but they are more difficult because if you have a crash, they're mainly males and they're mainly... Uh, you know, 20 to 30 years old and so mm-hmm. forth. 
The Benton fireworks explosion was different because you had males and females. Uh, in that case, it blew the arms and legs off, so it, and it blew the heads off of some of them. But uh, well, that you must had have been one of, horrific explosion. Yeah, terrific explosion. It really was. But what we had, we rented two refrigerated trailers. We put mm-hmm. uh, the torsos in one trailer, and we put the body parts in another trailer. Mm. And let's say that you have, you know, you, you've got legs, and so you have a pile of right legs and a pile of left legs. But in this case, we had a pile of shaved right legs and a uh. pile of unshaved right legs and a pile of shaved left legs and mm-hmm. unshaved left legs. So that if you had a female torso and you needed to find the legs that went with it, you would go not to the pile, just to the pile of right legs or something. You would go to the shaved pile because yes. most women shave their legs. And so of course. these are little... These are little cultural things that you can add into the anatomical mm-hmm. things that we've been talking about. Well, I, I want to mention this particular book. There's two books that uh, that you have that are the nonfiction works. Uh, the Death's Acre, which tells us about how the body farm was established, and uh, and then the Beyond the Body Farm, which is a description of a series of essentially legal cases uh, where your work solved mysteries. Uh, I mean, that's the broad definitions of these. And so I want to encourage people to pick these up. These are wonderful reads, real page turners, both. One thing I did want to get to, we only have about three minutes left, surprisingly. Uh, when, when, uh, Sorry, I talked to a boy. Oh, no, no, no. It's fascinating. <laughs> uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you is what are the things, let's, let's suppose we look at. Uh, uh, when someone came upon in, in your line of work a body a hundred years ago versus today, what can you tell today that they couldn't tell then? I'm sure there's a great deal of difference, but I know that from the work at the body farm, you're able to say, okay, maggots are here, therefore it's been X amount of time. That's right. If you go back a hundred years, uh, you can tell an awful lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, very few people knew had, had really studied the skeleton a hundred years ago mm-hmm. uh, and looked at the, the differences uh, between uh, males and females or between the races mm-hmm. or what age does to a skeleton. And that has come along essentially in my career, starting in the, uh, the 1940s and certainly through the 50s and the, uh, you know, up, up to 2000. Uh, uh, there's been an interest in looking at these anatomical changes or genetic markers that occur on, on bone. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in my career is that from, say, 60 years ago, when I've been doing this 60 years, uh, the police would bring you one bone. Mm-hmm. Uh, mainly it was a skull, but uh, they wouldn't bring you. They didn't think there was anything that you know you could tell from... Uh, the arms or legs or the ribs or things like like that. Uh, And so it has been a training process for me to convince the police that, hey, you need to bring all the bones because, let me just give you an example. Uh, If many people who are stabbed know that they're going to be, they can see the guy pulls out a knife, and so you're just not going to stand there and be stabbed. You're going to hold up your hand. So let's say that you hold up your left hand to ward off the attack. Uh, that hand is going to be cut. Mm-hmm. Now, the maggots that are there, maggots can't eat through the epidermal layer of skin. That's the outside layer of skin. They frequent the moist surface of the body, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, mm-hmm. and so forth, or any wound in the body. So when you see a, de- a a skeleton lying there or a body decaying, let's put it that way, mm-hmm. and the left hand is down to bone and the right hand still has fingerprints on it, that's your red flag. Uh-huh. You want to be careful because that's telling you something. Mm-hmm. Even before you ever touch that skeleton, you can say, hey, this individual has had his left hand cut or damaged or something like that or shot. And you want to look carefully because those finger bones can tell you a lot. Well, it's like, uh, you know, the old saying, I'm sure uh, you, you probably have this as a motto around there, that uh, dead men tell no tales, and you found that the dead men are quite talkative. They are. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a 
essentially what I've done is go into a field in which you learn what they're what that death is telling you. How do you read that death? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I I wish we had another hour to go, but I know we're going to talk again in a, in about six months when your new book comes out. The books that uh, I'm recommending today are Death's Acre and uh, The Body Farm by Dr. Bill Bass and John Jefferson, his co-author. Pick those up. They're really good reads. Thank you again, Dr. Bass. I appreciate it. Dr. Strong, I enjoy being on your program. Anytime I can help you, let me know. Uh, we'll, we'll do. Thank, thank you, you, sir. If you missed part of this or any other show, or you just want to share a good book with a friend, like us on Facebook at Good Books Radio Show.